This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Friday morning conference. Uh, I want to, to some of you, introduce uh, one of our uh, first year fellows, Dr. Colby Shanafelt. Uh, Colby uh, did his undergraduate studies at Duke, then went to Temple, if I recall, for um, medical school, uh, and then did uh, residency in Boston at uh, Beth Israel. Um, and as you can see, he's going to talk to us today about pulmonary embolism. Colby. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's nice to meet many of you virtually uh, for the first time. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. So uh, title of my talk is Advanced Therapies for PE. Uh, I have no relevant disclosures, unfortunately. And uh, starting out with some of the learning objectives. Now, I think PE is a big topic that we are involved in. Um, and I find it really interesting because there's really a lot of new therapies that are coming about without a really standardized way of necessarily addressing these. So what I wanted to try to do is make sure we can outline the classification system, talking about uh, PE severity, the risk gratification. You know, I think we've gotten a lot more familiar with these pulmonary embolism response teams, but overall, this is a pretty new concept still. So talking about the, the research and the utility behind the pulmonary embolism response teams, and then uh, dedicating the majority of the talk to kind of learning how to identify and understand the major advanced therapy options that we have at our disposal uh, for these submassive or intermediate risk and massive or higher risk pulmonary embolism. So starting off with the case, um, had a 66 year old female with a history of hypertension who came in with two days of worsening dyspnea uh, on minimal exertion. Vitals initially notable for a blood pressure of 130 over 70, heart rate of 102, uh, respiratory rate of 20, pulse ox of 92% on room air. Um, obviously, this prompted uh, further evaluation. She had a troponin of 0 0.08, with a BNP of 522, and a lactate of 1.3, and ultimately underwent uh, CT that showed a uh, pretty significant uh, right sided clot burden in her visceral uh, pulmonary artery here. Initially, patients started on a heparin drip. Uh, the next day, we get a, an ultrasound uh, that shows moderate RV enlargement with a right ventricular systolic pressure of 70 millimeters of mercury. So now kind of thinking about how best to treat this patient, uh, we kind of offer a more conservative strategy. Initially, keep her on the heparin drip, see how she does. But two days later, she's still very short of breath, more so than we would expect. Uh, we get a repeat ultrasound that shows a right ventricular systolic pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury. So again, at this point, we're, we're starting to talk about uh, advanced therapy options, and I really want to use this case as a jumping off point, uh, something that we'll definitely revisit down the line as far as what all we could really offer her. So a little bit of background about PE. It's the third leading cause of cardiovascular mortality in the United States. Uh, it's one of the most common causes, uh, preventable causes of hospital-related death, and it's something that we've been a lot more familiar with uh, as the overall incidence is increasing whether that's due to um, improvements in the way we're able to diagnose PE, also getting more comfortable with an aging population with a greater number of comorbidities. And in this setting, um, you know, throughout the last decade, there's been a growing number of options at our disposal, again, for treating uh, management of PE. So this is something that I really wanted to focus on for this topic. So obviously, whenever we're you know, hearing from our ED colleagues, inter um, internal medicine, um, obviously getting a history, looking at some of the big uh, risk factors, age, uh, comorbidities, including cancer, underlying heart and lung disease, um, you know, a physical examination being a key proponent as well, looking at your heart rate, blood pressure, um, signs of uh, possible right ventricular dysfunction, elevated JVP, uh, obviously our oxygenation respiratory rate. You know, we hear about a lot of these different scores that we use, the ED uses, on how we can kind of risk stratify and assess the PE severity. Uh, one of them being the pulmonary embolism uh, severity index or the PESI score. And this is something that really takes into account more of these history and physical examination findings um, since it's something that we'll revisit down the line. Obviously, you want to know what a patient's blood pressure is. I'm uh, talking about patients who uh, have um, lower blood pressures, less than 90, systolic, uh, denoting a higher risk pulmonary embolism, and then often asking for 
you know, data, including BNP, troponin, some of the ways we can um, have some um, cardiac biomarker evidence of RV strain, uh, troponin being associated with uh, myocardial necrosis. We know that elevations in troponin associated with RV dysfunction and uh, has pretended short, uh, adverse short-term outcomes. Um, lactate, you know, especially you know, something we're getting right off the bat, but especially in patients who's hypotensive, um, it's a key piece of information. And then, you know, obviously talking about imaging criteria, you know, CT being the first pass. Um, so looking for um, RV dilatation that we typically look for with an increase in the RV to LV ratio. RV dysfunction is measured by echocardiogram. And then putting all this together, um, we've obviously gotten familiar with these, uh, the terminology massive, submassive, low risk PE. Um, with massive PE defined as a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 uh, or a drop of greater than 40 millimeters of mercury for um, 15 minutes, need for inotropic or vasopressor support. Um, you can also see persistent profound bradycardia as a marker of massive PE. Um, overall, these patients account for about 5% um, of hospitalized patients with an acute PE with a mortality rate ranging anywhere from 25 to 65% uh, at 30 days. And then submassive PE denoting normotension in the setting of RV dysfunction or RV injury uh, with uh, evidence of uh, cardiac biomarkers of RV strain, BNP, troponin. Um, you know, again, when we think of RV dysfunction, we're typically looking for this increase in RV to LV ratio, which we define as uh, greater than 0 0.9. Um, also looking at resultant RV dysfunction on echo. And then like I mentioned too, even with troponin as a marker of myocardial necrosis. Um, as a group, submassive PE patients account for anywhere from 35 to 55% of PE presentations uh, with a mortality rate of uh, at one month of around 3% of this does vary depending on the type of treatment that's being offered. So some of the data behind this, um, we see that patients who have a combination of an elevated troponin uh, as well as evidence of RV enlargement have a worse prognosis with higher in-hospital related uh, PE mortality. Uh, compared to just troponin or RV dysfunction alone. We know that, you know, CT is our, really our first pass primarily on diagnosing PE. So I was kind of curious on how good CT does compared to echo with actually assessing RV strain. You know, sometimes we get a call from the ED about a CT that shows something when the echo is actually unremarkable. Um, so this is a study that compared the diagnosis of RV strain on CT to echocardiography um, looking at a composite outcome of severe clinical deterioration, uh, need for advanced therapy, thrombo uh, thrombolysis, thrombectomy, uh, or death within uh, five days. Uh, with the definition of RV strain via CT being an RV to LV ratio greater than or equal to 0 0.9, interventricular septal bowing, uh, and then echo um, having similar parameters, but also being able to assess for any RV hypokinesis. That was a total of 298 patients, uh, 104 of which had both CT and echo and kind of using echo as a standard criteria here, the test characteristics of both the CT uh, and echo were, were shown. And you can really see that the sensitivity is pretty good and very comparable 86%, but the specificity for um, RV strain for PE and CT is significantly lower at 30% uh, compared to 67% with an odds ratio for echo being uh, around 12 and that for CT being around 2.6. So, just keeping in mind that while they both have good sensitivity, the specificity is a lot lower for CT compared to echo. Next, you know, we, we think about EKG, you know, what does the EKG show? And I think this is kind of one of the best ways you can know you graduate from medical school when you can, you know, confidently answer the question of what the most common EKG finding is on uh, for PE patients um, uh, with sinus tachycardia. But again, looking at these, these other markers, um, of RV strain on, on EKG. So this, a retrospective study of hospitalized patients with PE looking at the different modalities, CT, um, where we can assess for RV to LV ratio. Here they use a ratio greater than or equal to one. Um, echo looking at uh, decreased TAPSI of less than 1.6 centimeters and, uh, and then visual RV hypokinesis on echo as well. And uh, they independently reviewed all these four markers of the RV strain and looking at the adverse outcomes being uh, use of a uh, requirement of thrombolysis, vasopressors, embolectomy, other advanced options. And we see in patients who have uh, CT evidence without decreased TAPSI, the adverse outcome rate is about 11%. Vice versa, no CT evidence, but a decreased uh, you know, estimate of RV um, systolic function, 
we see an adverse outcome rate of about 21%. But a combination of the two, and I think this suggests that there is an additive benefit whenever we see CT and echo uh, of an adverse outcome rate of about 30%. That being said, whenever we factor in any EKG criteria with the CT and uh, echocardiographic findings, uh, we see that there's really no difference in the adverse outcome rate. So suggesting that EKG really doesn't seem to actually be of predictive value uh, for these patients. So in revisiting the classification systems, there are a few differences between the AHA and the ESC uh, guidelines. So just to kind of go over this. Um, we obviously are comfortable with the term submassive. Many of you have probably heard about other ways, uh, like intermediate risk, intermediate high, intermediate low. Uh, these really come into play with the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, where an intermediate high risk PE denotes evidence of RV dysfunction and RV injury, uh, troponin BNP, whereas intermediate low either has one or the, uh, one or the other of these markers. Um, we kind of see that the ESC guidelines have more of a broader um, definition to what patients get classified in this intermediate or submassive group. Um, they factor in the PESI score, which is something that I alluded to previously. Uh, again, looking at age, uh, cancer, um, chronic respiratory cardiac disease, obviously our vital sign uh, parameters as well. And they factor in a score of greater than one, uh, regardless of RV strain. Um, you know, so Part of this is kind of, okay, well, who cares if what we call it? Like, it really just depends on how the patient's doing, what type of treatment we can offer. But I think that these classification systems that we use that denote intermediate, high risk, submassive, you know, low risk PE patients, they estimate, you know, death within one month, death resulting from PE, uh, and really being able to use more to identify these patients who actually may benefit from more invasive uh, monitoring and treatment. Whereas the PESI score is looking at you know, death from any cause within 30 days and is really used primarily more to identify low risk PE patients who can be treated just, uh, you know, with anticoagulation, just treated without admission overall too. So I think just keeping in mind whenever we're talking about these different classification systems, just what they actually assess for. And then just to briefly touch on uh, low risk PE patients, these account for about 40 to 50%, uh, 40 to 60% of hospitalized patients with an acute PE with a very low mortality rate of less than 1% at 30 days. I think we've all gotten very comfortable with just treating these patients with anticoagulation, not even necessarily with a need for hospitalization, um, but I think we're not really gonna focus much time on these today. So, you know, we have a lot of the, the criteria, a lot of the laboratory data that we want now that we're talking at, after we discussed with the ED and we've gotten our troponin, our BNP, but thinking about some of the future directions uh, for further markers of risk stratification. Um, there's some new echocardiographic parameters we're looking into. Um, other things like lactate, pH, GFR, or some of the other criteria. Um, this is a study that was performed that showed uh, that a combination of RV dysfunction, troponin, and lactate has a, a worse in-hospital prognosis as fine as uh, PE mortality, uh, hemodynamic collapse, um, compared to just RV dysfunction and troponin alone uh, with a negative lactate, you know, not to be unexpected that patients who have an elevated lactate um, are going to be doing worse, are going to be sicker patients uh, overall. And then uh, I found this study pretty interesting that, you know, patients who have a, a decreased GFR um, tend to do worse. So this is a prospective study of 141 patients with a confirmed acute PE. They looked at uh, creatinine clearance of less than 60 and found that both at 90 days and up to one year that these patients had increased mortality rates. Um, so we also see here that active cancer, uh, these patients also uh, pretend a worse outcome. And this is something we've already seen as part of our PESI score, some of the other big comorbidities with active cancer uh, showing um, you know, poor, uh, poor long-term prognosis with PE, short and long-term prognosis. And when you actually uh, go back through and look at, okay, well, if I were to incorporate GFR into my you know, um, stratification uh, classification systems. If you actually take these patients who had a GFR of less than 60 and, and factor this in as a, as a category or criteria here, we see that a lot of these patients um, that were previously called intermediate low risk now might uh, now would be placed in the intermediate high risk PE group and uh, ultimately be reclassified and then may benefit more from an advanced uh, treatment option. Something to keep in mind then too is, is just what the patient's GFR is whenever we're trying to gather all of our information. So yeah, so at this point, you know, we've gotten everything we want, and now we get a page that, you know, PERT alerts activated. 
Um, so the PERT teams are something that we, like I said, have gotten a lot more familiar with. Um, still a relatively new concept, but it's a you know multidisciplinary team that involves obviously cardiology, vascular medicine, interventional cardiology, talking about CT surgery, vascular surgery, emergency medicine, hematology, um, IR, pharmacy, palm crit, really all working together to try to figure out what the best uh, therapy is for the patient. Um, overall, as far as the um, the criteria of a PERT team compared, according to the PERT consortium guidelines um, is a multidisciplinary team that's able to rapidly assess, provide the appropriate treatment, um, able to exercise this full range of uh, mechanisms uh, to, uh, to treat these patients, uh, medical, surgical, endovascular um, techniques, um, provide appropriate follow-up. And then, you know, a big portion of this is being able to contribute to a lot of the research that we've been able to see um, going forward here. You know, as I mentioned, this is a, a relatively new concept. The first uh, PERT team was created back at MGH in 2012, citing the fact that you know, management of acute PE remains poorly standardized, that advanced therapies are often you know, underutilized or not available. Um, and some of the studies have shown thus far that this does really facilitate improved access to advanced therapy for PE. The studies show that increase of proportion of PE patients who underwent any advanced therapy from 9% to 19% uh, after the induction of the PERT team. But uh, while this is still a, a new concept, the data on long-term complications, improved survival, cost-effectiveness are still somewhat lacking. This is a study that we had performed at uh, Beth Israel, again, showing that um, kind of looking at um, some of the outcomes pre and post implementation of the PERT team, uh, we found there was a decreased rate of systemic thrombolysis and increased rate of catheter-directed therapies uh, decreased rate of IVC filter replacement, but really no change in major bleeding overall in hospital or PE related mortality and no change in 90 day readmission rates. So the ESC guidelines have given this a, a class uh, 2A indication um, for the formation, uh, for the recommendation for formation of multidisciplinary PERT teams. Um, so again, suggesting they should be considered depending on the resources that we have available. And Emory, um, you know, under the umbrella of, of Emory Healthcare being a big uh, proponent and founding member of the PER consortium too. And a lot of this research that's being done, you know, Emory is a big uh, hub with this too. Um, so I think it's another reason why we really want to make sure we, we know what we're doing and get familiar with treating these patients. Um, so now the PER team is activated. We're faced with, you know, what to do next. You know, we have this patient you know, to start out with, with submassive or intermediate risk uh, PE patients. And we know that we, I think this is a diagram that we've come to be familiar with, with the RV death spiral, um, where we have an insult, uh, increased PA pressure that leads to increased right ventricular afterload, subsequent right ventricular dilatation, tricuspid valve insufficiency, uh, changes in neurohormonal, neurohormonal mediators and myocardial inflammation leading to an increase in right ventricular oxygen demand, shunting, right ventricular ischemia, subsequent um, decrease in right ventricular contactility, decrease in right ventricular output, uh, changes in LV preload, cardiac output, hypotension, uh, decrease in coronary perfusion, and ultimately leading to this um, catastrophic cascade here. So we really wanna to try to get out ahead of this and figure out how we can kind of uh, intervene earlier on to treat these patients. So starting with systemic thrombolysis, um, the biggest trial was the PITHO trial done in 2014. Uh, it was a randomized double-blind controlled trial of uh, 1,006 patients with um, high-risk uh, submassive PE, uh, evidence of RV dysfunction and uh, positive troponin, who were randomized to anticoagulation versus full-dose thrombolysis. Uh, the primary outcome being hemodynamic collapse within seven days and found that in the systemic thrombolysis group, we do see a decreased um, rate uh, of the primary outcome of hemodynamic collapse compared to anticoagulation with a number needed to treat of about 29. But, uh, you know, looking at the safety outcomes, uh, primarily being extracranial bleeding, uh, development of ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke within seven days uh, of hospitalization, we do see that there's an increase in extracranial bleeding of 6.3% in the tenecteplase group compared to 1.2% placebo uh, and a higher rate of ischemic stroke 
uh, many of which of these, uh, or high rate of stroke overall, many of which of these patients underwent a, a hemorrhagic stroke compared to placebo. Um, this is similar uh, with some of the meta-analysis we've seen that systemic lytics do reduce early mortality uh, in these submassive PE patients with a number needed to treat of 65, but then looking at the major bleeding outcomes, you know, they are significantly higher compared to anticoagulation alone for submassive PE. The number needed to harm of, of 18 for major bleeding and 78 for intracranial or intracerebral hemorrhage. So the question kind of became, well, if we're using full dose lysis in these patients, what if we were to just use half dose thrombolysis, uh, half dose lytics? And we do see this study showed that there was similar efficacy, uh, changes in RV to LV ratio, decreases in pulmonary artery pressure, changes in perfusion scores. Um, and that, you know, while some of the data suggests that there are a decrease in major bleeding complications compared to full dose, here we see that uh, the complication rates, the bleeding complication rates are lower and the overall number of major bleeding events are lower. Um, some of the other studies have been somewhat conflicting. Uh, this is a study done in 2018 with 3,700 patients, uh, submassive PE, and really didn't find any difference in rate of uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, GI bleeding, or need for transfusion. Um, so I think for submassive PE patients, uh, systemic thrombolysis is really just being used more of a rescue reperfusion strategy uh, with patients clinically deteriorate. I'm really not a, um, a first pass, first line uh, therapy for these patients owing to the fact that there is this significant uh, bleeding risk. Uh, and it's been labeled a 2B indication for submassive PE patients, according to the AHA. So um, kind of where to go from here, you know, catheter-directed thrombolysis is also something that we've gotten more familiar with using. Um, some of the biggest uh, trials um, with the Ultima and ECL2 trial that I will uh, visit here, but this therapy really works by inserting a catheter into the kind of into the meat of the clot um, with the infusion catheter having holes on either side that can locally disperse TPA at a smaller dose at a slower infusion rate um, in order to try to be able to decrease um, the bleeding complications we've seen with systemic thrombolytics. The first uh, uh, FDA approved catheter was the ECOS catheter. So whenever we you know, here ECOS, this works similarly to what I just uh, showed, but it has um, um, an ultrasound vibration mechanism um, on the end that theoretically works to actually try to break up the clot in addition to um, mechanically breaking up the clot in addition to um, dispersing the, the local TPA. One of my mentors at Temple um, just had his uh, catheter FDA approved, Dr. Bashir. This is the Bashir endovascular catheter, um, which kind of has this web basket mechanism that disperses the TPA, but also tries to help uh, more mechanically break up the clot too. So this is something that was, like I said, just recently approved. Um, and then the biggest trial is really being the Ultima trial and the Seattle 2 trial. Uh, this was done back in 2014 with 59 patients uh, who were randomized to anticoagulation versus uh, ECOS, catheter thrombolysis, looking for changes in RB to LB ratio. Um, and they found that, you know, post, uh, post treatment at 24 hours and at three months, we do see a significant reduction in RB to LB ratio uh, with ECOS catheter compared to anticoagulation alone. Uh, and we similarly see a decrease in pulmonary artery pressures, uh, pre and post, uh, a decrease post um, utilization of ECOS uh, catheter thrombolysis with uh, overall pulmonary artery systolic pressure, diastolic, mean, a uh, decrease in right atrial pressure and an improvement in cardiac index uh, using treatment of the ECOS catheter. The other big trial, uh, you know, earlier on was the Seattle 2 trial. Um, this was a single arm study uh, using ultrasound facilitated catheter-directed thrombolysis in patients with either massive or submassive PE. Um, you can see here that they had symptom onset of less than 14 days. Uh, baseline RB to LB diameter ratio greater than or equal to 0 0.9, which we're commonly seeing as this marker, and then using the, the ECOS catheter. Um, the primary efficacy outcome was change in CT measured RB to LB diameter over 48 hours, and we do see that using ECOS, there was a 25% decrease uh, in this ratio. We also found a 30% decrease in pulmonary artery systolic pressure, uh, decrease in angiographic obstruction, and uh, really no episodes of intracranial hemorrhage overall. Um, this is one of the trials that was done um, 
at Emory looking at a meta-analysis showing again that patients treated with catheteric thrombolysis um, with uh, eight of these observation randomized trials, including the Seattle and Ultima trial, uh, does show a benefit in change in RV to LV ratio of about 0.34 and also an improvement in pulmonary artery pressure with a mean uh, decrease in right ventricular systolic pressure of 16 millimeters of mercury. You know, overall, a composite complication rate is very low for patients that are treated with catheteric thrombolysis. We see uh, an a intracranial hemorrhage rate of 0.35%, RP bleed of 0.35%, um, you know, 1.3% of axis site hematoma, and then, you know, about 1.9% of um, non access site uh, procedures requiring transfusion. So a composite outcome of just 4.65%. Uh, and again, citing the fact that the bleeding rates are much lower than we saw with systemic thrombolysis, uh, which is again highlighted here. It's a little bit higher than anticoagulation, not to be unexpected, um, but really lower than systemic thrombolytics. Uh, and then again, uh, just comparing the systemic thrombolysis uh, intracranial hemorrhage rate compared to CDT and anticoagulation, we see that there's a significantly lower rate. You know, obviously one of the big questions we wanna look at is what does the mortality show uh, with catheteric thrombolysis for these submassive PE patients specifically? And we find that there is a mortality benefit. Um, yeah, this is a, another meta-analysis that was performed of a, of a mortality rate of 0.74% compared to almost 3% with anticoagulation and 1.4% with systemic thrombolysis. I mentioned that the ECOS catheter uh, was the first FDA approved catheter, you know, citing the fact that, you know, theoretically this ultrasound assistance would uh, try to additionally help uh, as, a, as a kind of a two-pronged approach to break up the clock. But I think a lot of the, some of the recent data that's been accruing has been showing this ultrasound assisted catheteric thrombolysis, does it actually assist? You know, is it actually doing anything? Um, one of the trials done at uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, Emory Piedmont, um, compared standard versus ultrasound-assisted catheteric thrombolysis for these submassive PE patients using a primary um, outcome being 48-hour clearance of pulmonary thrombus uh, assessed by the CT obstructive index and found that there was really no difference in the um, uh, ultrasound group compared to the standard catheteric thrombolysis group. Uh, and again, Emory and Grady enrolling up to 22% of these patients. And we look at changes in RV to LV ratio, which is again, something that we're getting more comfortable with being a primary um, outcome measure. We see that, you know, the ultrasound group was not any better. And in fact, the, the standard catheterected um, uh, catheter really had an even more profound increase or decrease in um, RV to LV ratio post-treatment. This is a, you know, much less well-known trial that uh, I, you know, did it uh, when I was at Beth Israel, but again, comparing uh, catheterected ultrasound facilitated thrombolysis compared to CDT alone, and really showing that there's no major difference in, um, in outcomes for uh, these patients. We look at the adjust, unadjusted and the adjusted odds ratio, no change in in-hospital mortality, uh, no major change in 30-day readmission rates compared to um, the ECOs versus CDT alone. Um, so again, I think just kind of suggesting that there's really not might not actually be much of a benefit to ultrasound uh, in treatment of, of pulmonary embolism. One of the trials we're looking out for is the high pytho trial, uh, which is a randomized trial comparing ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis versus anticoagulation in submassive PE patients. So that'll be something to, to keep in mind, uh, to keep an eye out for as well. So we talked about the catheter-directed thrombolytic uh, group for these submassive for treatment for submassive and intermediate risk PE patients. I'm also talking about embolectomy, thrombectomy devices as well. So starting with surgical embolectomy uh, for submassive PE patients, this was a study done at Emory that compared um, catheterected thrombolysis versus pulmonary embolectomy, 126 patients, 60 treated with surgery, 66 with catheterected therapies. We see that there's no difference in mortality or need for transfusion, but there is a higher length of stay uh, of about five days compared to uh, catheterected thrombolysis. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the most common devices we're employing here is the Inari device, the flow retriever device, which is a catheter that we um, uh, insert in advance, kind of distal to the, to the PE clot burden, inflate this mechanism, and then are able to subsequently retract and withdraw the clot. Um, this is one of the, the models here, and this is the, the flow retriever 2. 
um, device. The biggest um, studies to be aware of here are the, the FLARE and the um, FLASH registry. So the FLARE was a prospective single arm multi-center trial, uh, catheter directed mechanical thrombectomy. Um, enrolled at over 18 sites, uh, with us being one of the primary endpoint, uh, primary studies here. Uh, the primary endpoint being the laboratory change in RB to LB ratio and looking at uh, safety endpoints, including device-related death, major bleeding, treatment-related clinical deterioration, a lot of the, the similar safety endpoints we've gotten familiar with. So I like this diagram here, uh, looking at panels A and B, we see uh, the initial and post-treatment uh, um, CT images here, looking at changes in RB to LB ratio, uh, pre and post um, NRA, which we see an improvement. And, and then looking uh, at C and D again, pre and post, uh, we see a decreased central clot burden and reduced pulmonary artery caliber, uh, post thrombectomy indicative of reduced pulmonary artery pressure compared with the pre-procedural CT image. Similarly, um, to catheteric thrombolysis, we see improvements in the RB to LB ratio uh, post-treatment, as well as improvement in the pulmonary artery pressure uh, post-treatment as well. And again, a uh, similar um, adverse event rate here, about 3.8%, which is saying that there's no intracranial hemorrhage, no access site, major bleeding, device-related death. There was a total of four events, three patients with treatment-related clinical deterioration and one patient with a bleeding event. But again, excuse me, a major adverse event rate of 3.8%. And then the FLASH registry uh, is a multi-center US registry, examines the efficacy and safety of uh, the flow retriever device enrolled up to 500 patients, um, looking at uh, major adverse events within 48 hours, similar to, to previous, and then some of the secondary endpoints being our hemodynamic effects, uh, procedural measures, mortality, and longer term outcomes. Again, uh, found a decrease in pulmonary artery pressure by about 7.2 millimeters of mercury uh, and an improvement uh, in RB to LB ratio assessed by ECHO uh, post uh, NRA. I like this figure here. We talk about RB systolic dysfunction at 30 days. We see a lot of these patients who were treated um, had severe uh, or moderate RB dysfunction and after treatment were reclassified into uh, a big proportion, 70% that had no RB dysfunction and 20% uh, with mild. So you know, over 90% of these patients uh, really had uh, mild or no residual RV dysfunction after treatment. And the flash registry is similarly showing a, a very low rate of 30-day mortality, a low rate of access site complications, and about three, uh, three day length of stay on average. So going back uh, to the meta-analysis, this is a similar figure we looked at before. Uh, again, very low mortality rates uh, in patients treated with catheter-directed embolectomy uh, with a flow retriever device, 0.5% compared to 0.74% with catheter-directed thrombolysis. The uh, penumbra device is an aspiration catheter, uh, which is, you know, might be what the future holds. Uh, it's a form of mechanical aspiration whereby this catheter provides suction uh, to achieve percutaneous thrombectomy either with or without the need for um, thrombolytics. I think this has really been something that's been seen primarily with uh, neurology, neurosurgical patients for treatment uh, of strokes, uh, but it's now kind of being uh, used for PE as well and DBT. One of the more recent studies that was done just in February was the Extract PE trial um, that took uh, 119 patients with submassive PE um, uh, using the Penumbra device, looking at a composite outcome of uh, 48 hour major adverse events, device related death, major bleeding complications, uh, serious adverse events, finding only 1.7%. And again, showing a, a mean reduction in RV to LV ratio uh, post, post treatment. Um, and then of note, they were able to actually avoid the use of intraprocedural thrombolytics in 98.3% of these patients. Now, I think so far we've looked at, you know, a lot of the data that I've presented has been, you know, in hospital, five days, seven days, one month, three months. But a lot of the long-term data with, with many of these therapies has been overall lacking. I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're also getting used to patients with CTEP who present and a question that, you know, is, is very common is, well, do these devices help prevent the development of CTEP? You know, what's the impact on long-term quality of life? Other objective measures like six-minute walk trial. So I think this is definitely some of the future 
uh, where, the, where the future lies and some of the research looking at um, changes in these as we continue to get more familiar with these devices and accrue more data. And going into massive uh, pulmonary embolism, obviously these patients um, are a lot sicker, um, uh, present more severe, have higher mortality rates, 52.4% uh, compared to 14.7, looking at massive PE versus uh, non-massive PE patients. Uh, this is a meta-analysis that it suggested improved outcomes with thrombolysis for massive PE. Um, only 254 patients in this study, but we see as a composite outcome of recurrent PE or death that thrombolysis compared to heparin, these patients do better, but whenever we substratify with recurrent PE or death, it doesn't uh, really meet statistical significance. Um, but again, there is this higher rate of major bleeding um, to be expected whenever we give someone systemic thrombolytics. Um, this study took 21,000 patients uh, with massive PE randomized to, or who received um, thrombolytic therapy versus no thrombolytic therapy. And we see that while there does suggest a mortality benefit, you know, of these massive PE patients, these 21,000, only 9,800 actually received thrombolytic therapy. Um, so just something to, to keep in mind when we look at this, there was a lower utilization for these patients, uh, even though this mortality benefit was seen. And then just a, you know, a word on surgical embolectomy um, for massive PE patients. I mean, this is, I think, more reserved uh, for you know, patients who are obviously hemodynamically unstable and whom thrombolysis, whether that's cathodirected thrombolysis or systemic thrombolytics is contraindicated or uh, more using it as a, as a rescue approach in whom thrombolysis has failed. We know that there are higher mortality rates uh, for these patients and that you know, as far as trying to figure out what patients might benefit, that proximal emboli may be more uh, amenable to, to surgical intervention. You know, some of the data does show that there's a similar uh, surgical and uh, thrombolytic mortality uh, for these patients. But again, kind of using surgical embolectomy as, as a mechanism, this is 488 patients uh, who underwent thrombolysis, uh, 40 of which did not respond. And then using embolectomy as a rescue approach in 14 of these patients compared to repeat thrombolysis, um, we see that there's you know, a decreased rate of death in the rescue embolectomy group, but probably underpowered to detect that difference. And then uh, there was a lower rate of recurrent PE in the rescue embolectomy compared to uh, repeat thrombolysis. One of the newer things to keep an eye on, we, we talked about the FLARE study, the FLASH registry, and then uh, the FLAME um, trial is something that's currently enrolling. It's a multi-center uh, parallel group observational study evaluating treatment outcomes with the Inari device for these massive PE patients. Uh, looking again at similar composite uh, endpoints, safety data, and following this patient through hospital discharge. So I think this is another thing to, to look out for uh, in the future. I mentioned, you know, with the uh, advent of the pulmonary embolism response teams that uh, IBC filter use had gone down. Overall, we really don't see any benefit to IBC filter placement in these high-risk PE patients. Uh, these are patients, all patients who um, had a concomitant DVT, who either had an IBC filter place or did not, and we see no changes uh, here uh, in rate of recurrent PE. Overall, a class three indication for IBC filter placement in PE, so not being recommended. So I think all that being said, jumping back to our case now, we've kind of reviewed you know, what was really at our disposal to treat this patient. Again, this is the 66-year-old female um, hypertension coming in with uh, PE, hemodynamically stable, but does have RV dysfunction and pretty significant RV systolic pressure, initially managed conservatively, who had um, some of a clinical deterioration going forward, and ultimately decided to uh, use the Inari device here. This is kind of looking at the, um, we can see that the perfusion is, is not adequate in this, this end here. Advanced the catheter uh, distally, and then we're able to uh, inflate the catheter here, expand the catheter rather than inflate it, and then withdraw. And we see that this is the amount of clot that we were able to uh, take back. Shooting the films again, we see that the perfusion is much improved afterwards, um, immediately afterwards, actually, with a baseline pulmonary artery pressure of 45, and right afterwards, a drop of 13 millimeters of mercury, which you know corresponds to what a lot of the data has shown as far as our reductions. Uh, an echo performed prior to discharge, uh, actually the next day, showed an RB systolic pressure of 45 down from 90, uh, improvement in um, RB to LB ratio, and this patient was able to go home the next day on a, a NOAC. So 
Uh, again, even talking about the length of stay with the NARA device was about three days, but this patient was able to go home very soon after for someone who um, actually really wasn't doing well. Um, so just to kind of summarize my learning points here, that we know that PE is a leading cause of cardiovascular mortality, that the use of these pulmonary embolism response teams has led to increased utilization of advanced therapies, but again, some of the long-term data are lacking. We know that the catheterected therapies, including um, catheterected thrombolysis, catheterected thrombectomy, have shown um, you know, excellent efficacy and safety for management of these submassive or intermediate risk PEs. And this systemic thrombolysis, while it does carry a higher rate of uh, major bleeding, it remains the mainstay of treatment for uh, massive or high-risk PE patients. Um, you know, I'd really like to thank Dr. McDaniel and Dr. Jabber, who really assisted in the preparation of this talk. Um, and I'd love to open up for any questions. I'd love to kind of hear your guys' thoughts, too, with, with these devices that we use, with catheterical thrombolysis, with uh, Inari, kind of how you frame um, that decision to pursue one or the other, whether that's location of the clot or, you know, what we have at our disposal. Uh, but thank you very much. Thank you, Colby. Uh, very good review. That was great. Um, yeah, I guess that's sort of my, you, you sort of beat me a little bit to my question. As someone who's not always involved in sort of the meat of these conversations in terms of, you know, to me, I, I guess for, it's, it's a bit of a black box, you know, we see the PE patient, the PERT team assesses them, and then sort of how that decision is made of, you know, full dose lytics, half dose lytics, catheter directed thrombolysis, catheter directed drum, you know, versus surgical, like sort of your or, or other members of the audience sort of assessment of sort of the different points. I mean, I know some of it might be local expertise that weighs into it. Obviously, there's a lot of patient factors that weigh into things as well, but sort of what, how, how that sort of decision-making goes. It's a, it's a disease with a lot of like pretty good therapies. Obviously, I think if there was any one amazing therapy, we wouldn't have all these, you know, options, different options. You know, you just have the one thing, you know, uh, that, that everyone would go to. So how, how you decide amongst these, all these sort of good, but maybe not perfect treatment options. And Colby, you can take it if nobody pipes up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so, you know, I think it's it's also like, as we're trying to contribute to this research, I think we're really trying to accumulate enough data uh, based on what we have available. I know that we're using the Inari device a lot more. We obviously use it under this uh, context here, but, you know, I think that what's actually amenable, I think from what I have seen, you know, in my, you know, limited uh, capacity here has been that, also, the, the location of the thrombus can kind of dictate what type of uh, device is, is most amenable or most appropriate. With a more proximal or significant clot burden, might be able to um, be more adequately retrieved with the Inari device compared to something that's more distal, um, might be a little bit harder to uh, manipulate and extract. So that's really what I've, what I've seen with these patients. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of my familiarity with it. So, uh, yeah, Colby has a great uh, great talk, and I, I completely agree with your thoughts. Um, a lot of it is always local expertise and, um, you know, individuals' familiarity with different devices. With that said, I think if you said, what is the single greatest way to get a lot of clot out? It's surgery. Um, surgery, there's nothing that just removes all of the proximal clot like surgery. So, um it's, it's a fantastic procedure uh, when done on the right patients. And so when we see these giant thrombus burdens, approximately huge saddles, um, there's really not anything else that we have that can remove all that. And so surgery is, uh, I think, a great choice. Um, and again, more proximal on the right side, the Inari seems to have a better efficacy on the right main PA clots when they're more distal main PA they actually have a little bit harder time with the saddles, although it can often get them, but it's, but you need to be able to grab onto something. And so the distal right main PA seems to be a sweet spot for Inari. 
uh, we're getting better with the left-sided clots and, um, and the success is definitely improving on that side. Uh, catheter lysis is extraordinarily predictable, but it requires TPA. I think uh, half-dose lysis is a nice strategy, but it, um, it probably carries the same bleeding complications as full-dose uh, systemic lysis and what most of the registry studies would suggest. So it's really pretty much fallen out of favor given the complication rates. So I have so a this, question. Oh, go ahead, Neil. Oh yeah. So 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 I have, um, I guess, sort of two two questions and a, or a question and comment embedded within each other. So so what one is you know I think, you know, at the end your last slide talked about demonstration of safety and efficacy. I think it's very clear that we have pretty good. Um, we've accumulated pretty good safety data with with most of these uh, devices. I have to say that the efficacy question still remains to me um, pretty unclear. Uh, the the one the one study that, that I don't think you mentioned. If you did, it, I may maybe um, uh, I, I may have missed it. But you know, the long term outcomes from the Pytho study with full dose lytics, I think, are pretty humbling in the sense that that's a, you know, long-term follow-up of the, probably the best randomized trial that's been, or the largest randomized trial we've done in the submassive population don't really show much of a difference. Um, and, and we have, you know, a lot of the sort of pooled data really amount to pooling of um, single arm studies, really because of device regulations probably, um, and historical or, or sort of registry kinds of controls, which which I think are you know our, our data are are not what any of us I think would want with regard to the efficacy piece, um, especially with regard to the long term piece. So so I'm curious what your thoughts are on um, kind of how to go about getting those data and what what our what our prospects are for 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 really. Um, uh, guiding these decisions uh, moving forward it's very clear we have tools that work um, in certain ways, I think our challenge is figuring out who to use them in. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, you know, I guess I would say that the efficacy was good, at least in the short term area, because again, a lot of this long term data is lacking. Right. Um, but I, I think, you know, like the, the high Pytho trials need to look out for as well, um, to kind of see what they find and uh, more of a randomized approach here. But uh, Dr. Martin, I'm not sure if you're aware of any other major trials that are kind of looking more at focusing on some of these longer term, you know, outcomes or long term data. I think I think one of the things that hopefully the PERT consortium and others can can sort of tackle down the line, it's been really, really hard to do the it requires really substantial multi center collaborative efforts to be able to do randomized trial at this kind of scale because these patients aren't they're, they're frequent enough to be a common problem for us, but not so frequent that they're easy to do studies in. So it's a I think it requires a really well orchestrated collaborative effort um, to get behind a trial, and that's been hard to do. I yeah, I echo everybody's thoughts there. I mean, um, th this is we need more data. I agree, Neil, that there's not a lot of great data. High pythos will be our best study um, that will come out. Um, you know, it's, it's enrolling now. Uh, and anticoagulation versus catheter-directed lysis in high-risk submassive PE. So that'll that'll use uh, endpoints of both in-hospital adverse outcomes, but we'll also have a follow-up arm. So we'll hopefully get to some of the symptomatic benefits that uh, um, you know are there symptomatic benefits. Uh, Wissam is actually also leading another randomized trial. He's going to be uh, the uh, national PI on an Inari versus catheter lysis trial that's gonna be starting up here. So hopefully between those two trials, we're gonna get um, you know, our first large randomized data in this space, um, which is highly needed. Um, and so you know, hopefully between those two, those two trials, we'll, we'll learn a lot about you know, what the benefits are and how to select uh, between some of these strategies. And uh, the last kind of comment about that, the follow-up from, you know, high pythos has a lot of limitations. Um, it is the biggest look, but it wasn't designed that way. And so um, I think I would caution any, any 
conclusions using the follow up from Hype. I mean, I'm sorry, from Pythos. Um, it's the biggest look, but there's a lot of limitations in that data set. And there are other randomized data that are probably cleaner but smaller that suggest uh, a symptomatic benefit. So I would, I would just say that what we've done so far in the literature and looking at follow up has been inadequate. And we, we need better data moving forward. Uh, the PERT consortium is definitely interested in this. And, and um, like most things in life, it's all about funding. And so finding the right partners, finding the right funding to get the trials done. So hopefully uh, it's exciting time and moving forward, we'll get a lot more data. I have a quick question. Um, so all the efforts, you know, regarding uh, treating PE are focusing on removing clots, the mechanical obstruction. However, there's a cytokine mediated component to this. Uh, you know, the serotonin release, for example, causes diffuse pulmonary vasospasm, which is part of the badness of acute PE from PE itself. But also sometimes when you're when you're in there, um, removing clot percutaneously, uh, sometimes sometimes uh, uh, things can get worse before they get better. So, so my question is, are there any um, efforts or data in terms of treating the cytokine components? Um, you know, particularly given the some of the recent interest in and in some of using some of these molecules in um, in COVID, uh, COVID related uh, inflam inflammation, et cetera. I, I've not seen anything, but I was wondering if, if, uh, if anyone on the line sort of have, has, has seen this. I, I haven't, Mon, it's an interesting topic. I mean, interesting concept. I've not seen anybody explore it. Probably something for us to think about. I mean, this is why this is why you know if you chop off someone's lung, just chop off someone's lung, they're okay, right? But if you put a fresh angry clot in that same right pulmonary artery or left pulmonary artery, they can get critically ill. Even just a segmental PE, if it's angry enough and and secretes enough cytokines, can can cause a lot of badness. So I I wonder if there's an opportunity here uh, to, to to further our understanding. I agree. I like, I like the idea. I'll have to dig into it a little bit more. It's a really interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, Mike, Stan Sherman, can you hear me? Yes. Is there any, is there any uh, clear cut? Is it no acts that we give after the intervention? Is that clear cut now? Or do y'all sort of you know, examine the patient, say what's the bleeding risk and what do you do afterwards and how long do you do it afterwards, after the interventions? Colby, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're definitely a lot more comfortable with using NOAX as primary therapy, you know, for these patients. Um, I don't know if there's anything, you know, different that you look for, Dr. McDaniel, but yeah, I'd say that NOAX are really the, the primary. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Um, as soon as we Kind of, as soon as we decide that there's no more invasive procedures necessary, uh, then that's usually the time to transition to NOACs. Um, and uh, there's a lot of interesting data on the use of half-dose NOACs as extended therapy. Um, you know, what to do with the first uh, non-provoked BTE is, is a little bit of a debate. You know, if it's provoked, clearly provoked, you do a short three month. If it's clearly recurrent, you do lifelong anticoagulation. But if you're in that in intermediate group where it's your first non-provoked, which is the vast majority of PEs that we see, you know, how long to treat is unclear. And there's some interesting data that you do a short course, three, six months, full dose, and then lifelong or indefinite half dose. And that seems to have a better uh, risk benefit ratio. It seems to be have about the same bleeding risk as aspirin, but similar efficacy compared, compared to full dose. So an, an intriguing strategy in two large randomized trials, uh, one with Eliquis, one with Seralto. Uh, 
Hey, Colby, that was a good talk. This is Terry here. Um, I had a question when you were looking through the per consortium stuff, is there any description of like per site what the breakdown of the PE team typically is? And I guess the reason I ask is I feel like both in residency now and here in fellowship, even though places have per teams, I feel like you end up just talking to one person and maybe, uh, maybe I'm not behind the scenes when there's more complex cases, but I feel like it's usually just headed by one team or one person. Yeah, I think it's a great question because I know that, you know, we obviously are a lot more comfortable with it here, you know, kind of our protocol is, you know, we get the pages first line, we reach out to, you know, interventional to try to discuss what options might be available, but I know that, and, and just at least as far as where I've been, I know sometimes IR is a little bit more involved uh, with this and can do the, the procedures, but I think at least primarily from what I've seen, it has been more of the cardiology kind of heading it. And I've definitely been present where there are these, there are these, um, there's these groups that form where everyone can actually comes together physically and has a discussion, but uh, at least what I've seen over here, and again, this is more in the setting of, you know, overnight and, and triaging things, but um, it's been more from like the cardiology standpoint. Um, but, uh, but again, I'm not sure like, you know, location for location, I think it's a great question, but who is the primary point person or who this was intended to kind of be as the point person whenever the per consortium was formed. Um, Dr. McDaniel, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts as, you know, we're obviously big, some of the, the founding members of this. Yeah. I mean, the bottom line, I think for this is that it's, uh, the way I've heard it described, which I like, it's the coalition of the willing. Um, each, it really comes down to who is interested and at each individual hospital, you end up finding a local group of people who have an interest in PE and you sort of take who you can get because there's really a lack of interest for most physicians in this space. So, um, and I say that because we're, we, I, I say that to try to get enthusiasm in the in the PERT organization, in the PERT approach. We need more interested people. We need people involved in the PERT organization and the PERT teams. And so every hospital, every system has really figured out how to way to cobble this together. Um, there is no unified approach. Um, there's really no, no dedicated structure. You really just sort of work with who you have at a local level and figure out how to make it work, you know, try to figure out how to get a call team together, try to figure out how to communicate. There's a lot of new technology that's coming um, that will hopefully enable this, uh, there, that will, you know, make um, communication easier with a team-based approach. Um, some of our current systems sends emails on PERT activations there are ways to also send images and we're exploring some of the other uh, solutions. There's some AI-based technology that actually uh, detect PEs um, and can be used to alert the team um, and then send the images to the team so that then the team can start to look at it. So we're exploring lots of different ways to, to activate, to collaborate. Um, if, if everyone knew what to do, there'd be absolutely no need to have a team-based approach because you would just do what you need to do, right? No one would ask like 10 people what 10 opinions were if you knew what to do. The reason for PERT is that we don't know what to do. So we try to get the interested people together to think about it. And, and usually with consensus thinking, we found that you get a little bit closer maybe to the best therapy, uh, but, but, it's, but it's, um, it does have its challenges. So. The bottom line is, is it's it, the PERT is about interested people who are interested in a PE, and we'd love to have more interested people, both locally and nationally. So, um. Mike, I think we're all interested, but maybe just not interested to get up in the middle of the night. <laughs> I understand. Completely understand. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, to Colby for an excellent review of the of the literature, and thank you to all the faculty and, and especially Dr. McDaniel for being here uh, for a, a, a very good discussion. So, for the sake of time, I think we'll wrap up here and uh, look forward to seeing everybody uh, next Friday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.